This is Matthew Miller, and this is another Fedora Council video meeting. Uh, so we try and do these about once a month. Uh, in general, we don't want the Fedora Council to be driven by meetings because meetings are terrible. But on the other hand, communication is essential, and it's turned out that having meetings actually makes things move forward. And so we also want to have occasionally high bandwidth meetings where we talk to different parts of the project about what's going on and you know produce a video that people can, can share and you know get the Fedora Council updated on the status of things. Um, we had some communication crossed wires this week and this wasn't actually on the calendar. So Matthias and Alan, I'm glad you could actually show up at last minute here and we'll try and make this as productive and useful as possible. Uh, Alan and Matthias are from the Fedora Workstation Working Group and both on the desktop team at Red Hat as well. And uh, the topic we suggested for this meeting is GNOME 40. So we're going to hear a little bit about that now that's been out in Fedora 34 for a while, uh, kind of a highlight of Fedora Workstation and about future plans for that. Um, and then maybe some things about the uh, Fedora Workstation and Fedora Silverblue efforts in general. So first of all, welcome. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having us. Do you want us to introduce ourselves or should we just dive right in? Yeah, in introductions sound great. All right, then I'll, I'll make a start. As you, as you said, I'm Matthias and uh, I manage a part of the Red Hat desktop team. And the people who work for me mainly work on on the GNOME part of the desktop, like I have Florian Muna working on GNOME Shell, Benjamin working on GTK, and a bunch of other people, and, and we maintain uh, both the Fedora packages to some extent and the RHEL workstation packages, of course, and do a bunch of work upstream. And Alan uh, is the designer on my team, and he kindly agreed to uh, support me here. Um, we are both not very well prepared, so we we'll have to rely on um, some questions from the audience to. Um, what you guys are interested in learning. Awesome. In, in general, I have some questions, but I also encourage other members of the Fedora Council, other people on the call to uh, jump in with questions. I think we have this pretty informal. If you have a question, turn your camera on and ask it. Um, and Alan? Yeah, hi. Um, as um, already mentioned, I'm a designer in the desktop team. And um, I do a fair amount of my work upstream um, on the GNOME project. I've been doing that for a fair while. I'm a part of the design team there. I'm also on the Fedora Workstation Working Group, uh, where I, you know, I kind of naturally end up in that kind of design UX liaison kind of role, just because of the kind of work that I do. So um, trying to make sure that Workstation is aware of what's going on upstream and it's, um, everything's coordinated effectively. Cool. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start with a, a hopefully e easy question. Um, GNOME 40 was the topic here, and I think obviously a lot of people have been exposed to it now. It's not hot news anymore, but I think um, we can kind of talk a little bit about um, where, where this came from, um, you know, why, why is it 40 all of a sudden after it being three for a long time? Um, and you know, kind of what the design motivations are and uh, also, you know, what's the, what the next steps are in that design? Uh, yeah, so maybe I can, I can take the first part or the second part of your question about the mysterious version number change. Um, so okay. that is uh, something that um, started being discussed, I think about a year ago where people figured that we have been doing GNOME 3 for a very long time now, and our minor version numbers started creeping up towards the Middle Ages. Like, um, yeah, the, well, we were well into the 30s um, with GNOME 3, 36, 38, and then people eventually figured um, this is getting too big, and so we decided to do the um, usual drop the first digit approach to shortening your version number. Uh, so GNOME 40 really is GNOME 3.40, and we just uh, stopped saying the 3 in front of it. Um, now, um, of course, this has some implications for um, downstream handling of uh, version numbers in packages and whatnot, so there are some complications around this, um, but I think everybody has adapted to this uh, more or less well by now, and um, going forward, we will do, um, uh, we used to do the even odd thing where we had like the um, 
vision numbers always split out by two. We had like um, 330, 332, 334 following each other uh, with the, um, the odd numbers being reserved for development. And um, as part of this change, we're also dropping that uh, somewhat old approach to, to versioning and we'll just um, bump our version numbers by one for each stable release. So the next GNOME release uh, this fall will be GNOME 41. So it's still going to be on a six month schedule as well? Yes. We did, so, we did take our release schedule a little bit and we cut down the number of like intermediate snapshot releases, like reduce the work that people have to do just rolling top walls and, and writing release notes. And, but yes, we, we stick to the six month cadence, which is it's very well established and is also, um, I, I think, something that our downstream consumers rely on a lot. So Fedora, for example, um, kind of needs to have a new GNOME release somewhat well synchronized with the next Fedora release and uh, a lot of other distributions are in a similar so position. Basically add six to the Fedora release number to get the corresponding GNOME release number. We'll have to, I don't know, do something to catch up somehow. I yeah. Don't... I don't know. I sort of, um, part of this, uh, the, the complications uh, that came up when we were discussing this versioning change was that we did not want to do a GNOME 4 because a lot of people have traumatic, traumatic memories uh, to the whole GNOME 3 uh, change, which was uh, problematic. And um, we, we took a long time to, to living down that, that memory of people and we did not want to, to raise their fears that, oh, we are doing that whole GNOME 3 thing again. So we kind of did not want to do a GNOME 4. We wanted to have some uh, change to the versioning that, that was not perceived as throwing over everything. And now then, in the end, we ended up having a release that we call GNOME 40, which also includes GTK4 and a whole new GNOME shell user experience. So I guess we kind of messed up the, uh, trying to avoid <laughs> batching too many big changes together with the version number change, but uh, what can you do? So it uh, was not really meant to be dramatic, but ended up being dramatic anyways. No, I hope it was amazing, but <laughs> everybody can make their own judgments. Um, so I've seen I've seen generally positive feedback from people overall. Does that match with your experiences? Are there um, are there things about it that I, one of the you know truisms is no, no design sur, uh, really survives first contact with actual users? Um, are are there things that um, uh, you're looking at, uh, at now that this is you know in in the Fedora release in other other Linux distro releases? things that you're looking at adjusting for GNOME 41 and beyond? Oh, certainly there, there will be tweaks, but I, maybe I, I wanted to hand the mic to Alan for a little bit to maybe talk about uh, some of the, the background to the, the changes or the, the backstory. Yeah, I mean, it was always going to be, it was always a bit nerve wracking um, making that release and um, making more substantial changes to, you know, the kind of, core elements of the, the desktop. Um, so we were, it was a bit nerve wracking, but I, I think we have been, you know, pretty pleased with the re response. Like um, we did do a fair amount of user research as a part of this. And it's uh, one of the most, the user experience changes that we introduced for M40 was one of the most heavily researched pieces of design work that we've done. And so that gave us some indication of how people would respond. We didn't, we weren't kind of pushing this out with, with no data on what we thought um, the response would be. And, you know, we had a professional piece of uh, research done by a research firm and they pretty much said to us, we think that this will go down well with your users. But it's always nerve wracking because that was still a relatively small sample. So you don't know quite how it's gonna go in real life, but it seemed to go pretty well. So really pleased about that. Um, you know, nerve wracking. I This is a roof right here and there are yes. roofers on the other side of it pounding on things. If you hear strange noises, that's what's that's what's going on here. I'm gonna try and keep my mic muted while I'm not talking. Um, also, that distracted me. Uh, but yeah, it is really nice to see you know, research and then um, that actually reflected in responses as well. It helps kind of, I'm sure that's yeah. very validating. Um, that was, that was are, nice. But yeah, I guess the second part was, are there are there new other changes that are planned um, that are coming up? Or what, what can we expect to see in GNOME 41 that's different from a UI perspective? 
Uh, in the shell side, I don't think uh, a huge amount. There's uh, some smaller kind of polish behavioral changes that we're kind of tracking, uh, just general kind of refinement of under kind of bug fixing kind of stuff. Um, not particularly looking at um, any more substantive UI changes on that side. I think you know, partly just we spend a lot of time on the shell and people are a little bit burnt out on the development side. So, um, you know, and so took time that people needed to spend on other things. So I think uh, we'll see less change on the, on the shell side uh, for 41 as people catch up with other work and uh, just take a little bit of a breather. Um, you know, we don't take, we don't make larger UX changes lightly, and it's not something that we want to do a lot. So I wouldn't say that people should expect um, anything like the level of change that we saw in 40, you know, anytime soon at all. There are plenty of things that we'd like to improve, um, you know, around the system status and notifications and more login improvements and all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, we continue to look at the, the new design that we introduced for the overview in 40 and think about how that can be improved. But um, I want to, you know, we don't want to see the same piece of UI being in constant flux. And so, you know, I don't think that's not the kind of thing that users should be expecting, I would say. Yeah, that's that's nice. I think people have some chance to get, get used to it. Um, yeah. I think one thing you might might see is that um, the focus will shift back, as, as Alan said. I mean, the UX changes will probably be very subdued in 41, but um, people have continued working on uh, performance things to make make sure that the compositor runs smoothly and does not get uh, behind things and, and can keep up its frame rate. And the, the major change if we landed in GNOME 40 kind of had some risk to like regress in some areas there, and uh, I'm sure um, we'll, we'll add improvements to make the performance um, be. There's continued work on atomic mode setting and on like breaking out an input thread that, that handles input events independently of that else is going on at the same time. Neil, why don't you jump on the camera and ask that question? Fine, fine. So you brought up, you know, improvements in Mutter and stuff like that. So something that I've seen as a relatively regular common complaint is that on the Wayland session in GNOME, um, gaming performance kind of sucks. Like the frame rate is choppy or too low, and game compatibility with it has not been good. Um, is there like some effort going on to um, focus in on improving that part of the experience? Because you know, at least from my perspective, I the the bigger enthusiast types that tend to want to that tend to be attracted to Linux for all the flexibility and customizability tends to be the gamers because they can get better performance if you can like have all the knobs to do all the right things. So I, I never play any games myself, so kind of this is all secondhand knowledge for me. But um, I will say that I recently got Carlos Ganacci a uh, a thousand hertz mouse, so he can actually work on on this kind of high resolution gaming mouse. Make sure that we don't add any unwanted latencies in the compositor and in the toolkit. So I hope that makes a little bit of a difference. Um, but hopefully, hopefully that will include making the scroll wheel go at a reasonable speed on my high resolution scroll wheel, my Logitech yes. mouse. Oh, oh, it's there's also uh, there's also um, an effort um, to add better support for high resolution scrolling, but that needs fixes up and down the stack. Like first, it needs to be fixed in lib input to provide the right events that um, make, need to make all the way. There's patches for that, but I don't think they have all landed yet. But that's also on Carlos's radar. The amount of infrastructure work that your team does that benefits the entire um, Linux desktop ecosystem. So I uh, shout out to your team there for that. Uh, the high, high resolution uh, scrolling support was actually mostly done by Peter Hutterer on the on the graphics team. That's cool. Wait, Peter's on the graphics team? Yeah, he's 
Yeah, but he's he moving on now to some other team. I mean, that, okay, we so were talking on X, right? So, I mean, X is graphics, so that, that's how these things. <laughs> that explains why I'm reviewing the wire plumber package from him, and I'm like, wait, what? Well, he, he's moving on to work on, on the pipe wire going forward, so there, there's some changes and rearrangement happening there. Oh, okay. Um, Akash Deep, you want to ask, come on video to ask that question, or should I repeat it? Sure thing, Matthew. Right, so right, awesome. um, being a laptop user primarily myself, uh, I've been using Workstation since some time now, but the the thick title pass is kind of something, has been something which has kind of stuck out to me. So would there be any offering in coming times and uh, the coming releases that would kind of make things a bit more fitting for laptop users who just want a sleek interface because, you know, the screen size is small, so would there be something like that? And do you have anything to say, or should I try? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not really sure about the screen size. Um, you know, I mean, we do primarily, you know, the laptops are obviously one of our primary form factors. The M40, we introduce a lot of enhanced support for, for gestures and made multi-touch gestures much part part of the experience. Um, on the screen display, um, I mean, certainly there's a lot of work going on around uh, adaptive layouts to make it easier to view multiple windows side by side. Kind of, we're always interested in kind of snapping and tiling like functionality and um, uh, kind of gradually improving the support for, for those kind of things. Um, increase, I, I'm, I'm uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, if there's anything else you're specifically interested in. Um. Yeah, I guess one thing to mention is the uh, new gestures for going to the overview and changing workspaces that landed in GNOME 40, which are supposedly a lot more focused on like laptops where you have a, a touchpad that you can actually use those gestures with. And as a general comment, I was going to say that it's actually um, an interesting uh, situation um, for my team that, like, on the on the rail side, where workstation is mainly used uh, on on like big desktop machines with multiple monitors and whatnot. But uh, most of the development down in, in Fedora and in, in my team, like most people, have laptops and and develop on those machines, those class of machines. So I think GNOME is uh, not really targeting workstations exclusively. Like, I mean, laptops are certainly at least for development purposes, the, the most immediate thing that we use day in, day out. I mean, I'm, I'm using GNOME on, on la my laptop every day. I've never used it on a, on a workstation for any amount of time. So something that I've observed at my workplace is that we've been moving away from, unless there's a really good reason for it, we've generally been moving away from giving people um, desktop class workstations, and we've just been giving people beefier um, notebook PCs and still giving them the multi-monitor setup and all that stuff. So like something that um, kind of stood out to me because we were talking about multi-monitor and gestures and stuff is that, um, you know, using GNOME 40 in this particular setup on, on my work laptop, uh, the, the thing that I kind of missed the most coming in from using a Mac is uh, each display in my multi-monitor setup gets its own set of workspaces and so you can kind of partition out your stuff and be able to cycle through them um, independently. And it's also like it saves the state of it. So if you unplug and replug them, the the applications actually go back to where they're supposed to be, which is useful for when you're take, preparing a presentation, going from one place to another, plugging it in, giving it, and that sort of thing. Is there any of that sort of stuff coming down the pipeline for, for GNOME? I know the uh, window placement when you plug and unplug has been historically a, a pain point for a lot of users. Um, I don't honestly know what the current state of that is. Um, but I know that historically some of the lim limitations of X um, didn't help with that. I don't know whether once we're living more and more in a Wayland by default world, that Handling those kind of situations will get easier. Hopefully they will. 
Well, we're in a Wayland by default world, aren't we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, this bad. that sounds like a killer, killer Wayland feature of um, my windows go back to where they were when I when I when I start Firefox and I've got multiple windows. Each of them goes to the workspace that I had for that window. Yes, please, because I I do that. I have my work stuff in one window, and my friends chat stuff in another window, and whenever I reboot. You know, I spend like five minutes rearranging my desktop, and that's um, – I don't use computers so that I have to spend five minutes arranging things. That's terrible. Uh, but So th that, that would be a, gr that would be a great feature. Spend yeah, the five right. minutes once. Right. I know. It, and honestly, um, that makes me apply security updates less often because if it were just a matter of I'd reboot and then things would come back basically like they are, I would apply security updates when I walk away from my computer sometimes, but generally I don't. That's probably terrible of me to admit, but yeah, you know, I think that's fine. I, I never reboot, so it's, it's perfectly fine to reboot. <laughs> I also know how to, you know, apply updates on the fly with DNF, but I really like the offline update mechanism for its Cleanliness. Yeah, I don't know. I guess we'll take a feature request here to take this more seriously. I mean, I know in the past we have had efforts to, to look at those kind of issues. We did have a whole multi-monitor push at some point in the past. So another thing that I hear a lot um, is the, um, I, I don't know what the, um, actual proper term of it is, you know, the status bar icons of running applications that have decided to hide themselves. And in particular, um, I am thinking of Zoom, which is unavoidable. Um, you know, when you close Zoom, it actually keeps running in the background. And if you have like Top Icons Plus or one of those things installed, um, it, you can actually see that it's there. But if you don't, you have to, you know, like go to top and kill it or something like that, um, which is kind of annoying. And obviously that's annoying proprietary software problems on the one hand, but also, you know, uh, Steam works this way too. Like um, it's, it's a thing people are kind of used to. And that has, I know there's not been an official GNOME 3 ap approach to that. Um, what, what is what is the plan? Black apparently also. Um, yeah, a one password, a, lo a long list of things that kind of depend on this behavior. Um, is there anything being worked on around that? In, not sure I fully understand the question. You mean like they de depend on being able to run in the background? I mean, they can do that, right? That works. Or you mean no, they, they, they depend on showing the status icon so that you can actually click them? Showing the status icon or showing some, yeah, some way to um, get at those applications that assume a status icon is available. I mean, using top icon seems like a, a fine approach to me that, that solves the problem, I, mean, I would say. Is that something we should look at installing by default in Fedora Workstation? Um. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, this is obviously something we've gone over various points in the past. Um, and it's kind of a, it's a, it's a really difficult problem, actually, like the, uh, there's a lot of technical constraints there in terms of what you can and can't do, um, and you know there are implementation issues which you know some of the maintainers aren't very thrilled about. So it's 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 a tricky tricky problem. Um, I mean, what I would say is, I mean, on the UX side, you know, um, I've been working recently on gathering more user data. Um, we've got a user survey coming up, and we've got someone in um, our team as well that's kind of working on um, helping us with that. And I think that will probably give us a better idea of you know which extensions people are using, which apps people are using. I think that will all having a better sense of how big those challenges are for the current users will you know help us to reassess these kind of questions, you know, like, do we install something by default? Do we need to deal with this? Like, you know, we can we can get a better handle on those kind of issues. Um, um, 
I wish there was an easy answer there. I, I'm, I'm not sure there is at the moment, but um, I think more data always helps. Yeah, I, I, I definitely I'm, agree with that. Yeah, I'm not I don't know if I'm necessarily representative of uh, a sample of like what um, Linux users <coughs> wind up having, uh, but my work laptop, uh, I have to have a, an extension installed in the GNOME environment for seeing the uh, seeing the app indicators because uh, basically there's no way to access some of the applications without it. And uh, on my work mandated setup of software that I have to have, there are seven of them that that exist basically persistently. One of them is the VPN software, which is extremely important to actually have. Yeah. There was a, there was a time when we were kind of tracking all of these uh, apps and just uh, keeping a tally of how each of them uses the status icon because it's actually highly varied. There is not, it's not like every app does it in the same way. Uh, there's a, a lot of different behaviors there. Um, no, for sure. I agree with you. It's and, just, and I, it's I don't know whether it'd be worth reviving that and you could put your, your, Experiences in there because um, it is it is good to know which apps people are using and how how they rely on it. Um, like some of the apps you can that do use a status icon, you can kind of get along okay without it, uh, but there are a few where it gets pretty hard. Right, like for Zoom, all I really need is kill all Zoom from the command line just every now and then. But uh, that. <laughs> I know you. I I sometimes use Zoom, and I've always been able to quit without the status icon. Uh, um, oh, you it's think you've quit? Difficult to totally quit it without yeah, the status uh, icon. Yeah. It's a, just yeah. one flat back kill Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the same, same thing, right? Exactly. Same thing. There's, there's, a, there's a quit menu item there, right? It doesn't quit the of... whole application. It just quits yeah. it to the menu. I think there may be there may be a preference that that tells it to yeah. stay right. in the yeah, background or something. Way. It, it, I think we can all agree that it is terrible software. Uh, right, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> like in the case of my VPN software, the only way to interact with it is through the status notifier. Yeah, yeah there are a few of those. Um, all right. Um, do other people have questions or topics here? Yeah, I'll jump in with one. Um, I was just curious when, you know, doing the, user research process, was there anything that just kind of stood out to you as, wow, we really did not expect to get that result from it, or, you know, something where you thought you'd get, you'd hear one answer and you heard the opposite? Uh, it's a little while ago. Um, <clears throat> so it's hard to remember all the details. I mean, we just got so much from those exercises. It's pretty incredible. Um, you know, I think somewhere we've just got a huge long list of issues to look at that weren't even directly related to the topic we were we were looking at. Um, the one of the ones that I do remember is, is jumping out. Um, we had previously just the release before. I think it was, must have been three thirty eight. We'd introduced a new uh, onboarding assistant. Uh, so you know, your first time you you run your new desktop, you've just installed it, and this thing pops up and it says, oh, you know, welcome to Fedora, whatever. And, um, you, you know, you click through and you get some little graphics telling you how to use it and so on. Um, and we used, we tested this, we used this as part of the testing because, you know, we wanted to make it realistic. We wanted users to be experience it like they were experienced GNOME 40 for the first time, so we gave them the onboarding, which we just introduced, and everyone thought it was fantastic. Like we got really positive praise in the reviews, lots of users telling us that the GNOME tour is fantastic, we really love this thing, and we put it in front of users in the tests, and it was a complete fail. Like um, they they would they would read through each step in the onboarding, and then they'd say, "So what do I do?" It was like it was literally just in one ear and out the other. Um, it was like they hadn't even been exposed to the thing. Um, so we we we, we kept little gamification tool. points to make sure people remember it. They get their gold stickers when they do the different parts of the 
you are. Yeah, so maybe, yeah, like, uh, I was thinking, is it not interactive enough? Is there no feedback when somebody tries to do something? Like, did you get yeah, any I mean, details we're... of that kind of thing? We, I mean, we've, you know, we've, we've got a bunch of theories that we, we talked it over in a fair amount of detail. I, th I think you're right. Partly it's the, the lack of interactivity. Um, partly, I think, is the nature of what's trying to be explained. The fact that you're, particularly with the, the one we had in 338, it was trying to present ideas with which new users have no frame of reference. Like click here to to open this whole new view that you've never seen before, like a bit a button that you've never seen before. But unless it's hyper realistic and actually talks you the, through the real life action of doing that thing and seeing it for the first time, you've got no frame of reference. So it's explaining something that people don't really have the the the, the knowledge to to understand. Um, so we did tweak the content a bit for forty. It's a bit more focused on features and what you can do rather than UI and how you use it. Um, and I think the tool still has a useful role in welcoming people, kind of showing them something when they first arrive and something pretty and just nice. And it, you know, it makes you feel good about the experience, even if it's maybe not um, really kind of educating, uh, particularly for the new users. Um, I think for a returning user who's maybe just done a reinstall, it, it's still kind of a nice thing. Mm. And particularly if something's changed. Um, I think long term we will be interested in doing something more interactive, and we do have um, we do have designs for that. And that'll be more of a actually clicking through the real shell UI with little kind of bubbles. Uh, you know, it's pretty pretty easy to imagine. Like, will there be there's... like some sort of cute cartoon, like office supply character yeah, absolutely. Yeah. floating yeah. over this? Mm -hmm. That's that's the picture in my mind here. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you can't do better than that. So that's, that's what we want. <laughs> um, Perfect. Yeah, uh, that's something we'd love to do, and I think there is some code out there that would allow us to do that. Even just didn't make it in for forty with everything else that was being worked on. I don't really ever think that surprised me in the user research, or maybe it came up there. I don't, I don't remember. But what surprised me from the like reactions uh, to Fedora 34 and, and Chrome 40 being released is one of the things that people complained about the most was the change from horizontal to vertical workspaces. I mean, that back when we when we did Chrome 3 uh, many years ago, we we changed from horizontal to vertical, and that got people upset. And we had to introduce classic mode to like bring it back to horizontal. Workspaces and even at like a horizontal workspace switch because people couldn't work with vertical workspaces. And now that we actually in, in Chrome made the switch back, people are still unhappy. So that I guess is a, yeah. not really surprising. Like any, any big change of that sort will have people unhappy. It seems like in some ways it's kind of a coin flip of which way you prefer, and you're going to make half of the people unhappy with either approach. Uh, yeah. Which, yeah, I, I know I, I have basically two different setups here. My desktop is just one big monitor, and then here um, at this thing, I've got a, a monitor here and then my laptop screen below. And with this one, I end up just not using the workspaces because it the it becomes too confusing with the two monitors and the workspaces to the side. And it's like, I, I just only use the main workspace. Then on my single monitor system, I use the workspaces all the time. Um, and Previously, I had actually used workspaces more with this setup, but meh. I also have this setup basically stays set up for video most of all the time anyway, so I don't have as much many different things going on, so that's part of it too. Anyways, this that's just my impression of it. Um, another thing I wanted to ask about um, that I um, I get a lot, this isn't actually GNOME 40 or even Fedora Workstation, um, but with uh, Silver Blue and what our plans as a team are for Silver Blue and where that's going. Um, I know, Matthias, you've done a lot for Silver Blue. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about where, what the plans are there. Yeah, but um, despite me having done a lot, of, I mean, there's not actually a big team behind it that like has big plans. I mean, like, it's just a thing that exists at this point, and we're trying to make it better little, in little bits here and there. But um, 
by and large, I mean, we, we don't have the resources to like push it forward as, as much as we would maybe like to. Okay. Sense. It's, it's kind of like got to the point that, that it is at now, and it's good. I use it like my laptop runs Silverblue, but um, that's that's maybe it for now. Like and, until we find a good opportunity to like take it to the to the next level. I, I think one of the problems is if it's a problem is that our upgrades and like uh, applying updates has been so smooth that like the major selling point of we can you know uh, the atomic updates to silver blue um, does, is isn't all that compelling we haven't really had problems with that um, some of the other yeah. like container focused things are nice but you can also do those on traditional Fedora workstation so um, I, I still think it's a really interesting concept, but um, I can also see why um, it's not like we have a building on fire we need to flee to that um, to solve. Right. I, th I think it depends on the user and the case. I mean, I, I think a system like Silverblue comes into its own, particularly if someone is going to keep the same OS installed for a long time and upgrade through a lot of different major versions. Um, you know, one of the things that you find with um, a package-based system is, you know, upgrading between two versions or three versions is kind of fine. But once you keep upgrading and upgrading and upgrading, the known state of that system, you kind of get this kind of entropy situation where you don't quite know where you are anymore, right? No one's really ever tested this this thing that you're running anymore because, um, you know, uh, I think there definitely are some advantages for some users who maybe aren't reinstalling so often. The main yeah, I thing I see as an advantage for Silverblue and, and one of the re driving reasons for us doing Kinoite in, in the KDE community, in the Fedora KDE community is um, there is a class of users that want um, a desktop that actually doesn't do a lot. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> And the, there are use cases where there are people interested in using that. Like, for example, one thing that has come up in the KDE community, we've actually got someone who's interested who really provoked the interest in creating Kinoite was they wanted to make Fedora the desktop to put onto computers for children. And in order to do that, you need a level of reliability and self-healing that you just don't normally get um, with a traditional um, environment when when you're giving it to actually children, and you need a way to make sure that the system is going to stay working and can be you know, reset trivially. This became this is a lot more valuable. And so, like the way I see it is that that's a the silver blue and Kinoite variants are interesting from that perspective because it opens up a a market vertical that has typically been closed to traditional operating systems. Period because it is a lot easier to um, mass manage in that particular style where you need to be able to have total control of the software that is on the desktop and be able to um, ensure that it's in a reliable known state consistently because you know that the user using it can't do anything about it. Yeah, I think That's there's true. also a lot of developers who are very interested in that same kind of minimalistic kind of story where you you, you have yeah that's actually that's a point I forgot to mention when Matthew asked that question about silver blue like the toolbox is the one part I guess of the silver blue story where we continue to like work on improving it and I mean there's there's some ideas that we maybe uh, could have nicer integration of the toolbox into into a terminal application and and have some more UI that makes it easier um, to find your way around your toolboxes and and that sort of thing yeah I am. Um really a big proponent of a toolbox uh, terminal integration things. Ever since I saw Owen's uh, purple egg demo thing, I think mm -hmm. it's a great, great idea that this would be a really compelling feature. Yeah. I think we do um, keep chipping away where we can at Silver Blue, right? I mean, one of the one of the challenges is that there's a long tail of problems you have to solve, right? There's all these little, little problems that have been solved in the package-based world, which you then have to come up with a replacement for that you don't quite expect. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing just how many small kind of 
limited exactly. scope kind of challenges there are that you just need to kind of work your way through. And I think as we're- It's like printing, and who wants to work on printing, right? That's- Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and storing right. the font, yeah. like- yeah. Yes, you know. no. And, um... and these are things that we do every once in a while, we'll come back to one of those things and we'll try, you know, if we're reworking it, we'll rework it in a way that is compatible with Silver Blue. So we are kind of working our way through the list, but it just, it, it's actually a long list, so it's just a, a slow process. That makes sense. Um, we've we've filled some good time here. Um, I one one of the other things I wanted to make sure we ask is, um, you know, this is Fedora Council you're talking to here, and we provide, you know, it's kind of overall governance for the organization. We have some resources in terms of money, time, project things. Um, what can we do for you? Um, as the workstation working group and you know gnome team working in fedora to make things better for you i mean i and it's maybe worth saying like first of all like you know fedora has a really strong presence upstream in the gnome project if people don't know that already like i think fedora is pretty much the de facto distro that upstream developers use and you know a lot of the time if i'm testing a, a new app or a new system component, you know, it's fairly typical for the, the build instructions to be for Fedora, for coppers to be available for Fedora. So that is where a lot of the upstream testing goes. So, you know, I think the first thing to say is that's really great and let's not break that. Let's let's keep that going. Because I think it puts, it's really mutually beneficial. And, you know, the way the release schedules are synced up really helps with that. And I think we've done a great job there in terms of developing. Yeah, and things like test dates and like just having, yeah. yeah, as Alan says, the soup between the, the Fedora release cycle and the GNOME development cycle really makes that easy. Yeah, uh, I am on the GNOME advisory board, partly to help keep that relationship going in a nice smooth way. And uh, it's a good time to plug Guadac as well, the GNOME conference coming up in a couple weeks. We will have some good Fedora presence there as well, including a um, Ask Me Anything session. Yeah, I think it's just two weeks away now. It's July 21st to 25th. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, still virtual. Uh, I, I was looking forward to the in-person one. It was yeah, me too. In, Next year. In Riga, so, I think, that where it was supposed to be. I uh, think we may go back to Mexico still. But, um, okay. I don't know right. that for a fact. I, I'm 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 ready for it. Me too. Uh, I, uh, other uh, things I can think of that council yeah. could potentially do. I mean, the the user research study that I, I referenced that was that was done upstream through a financial support by a partner. So you know, I said like more data is always good. If there is something in the user experience realm that Council is particularly interested in, and I, th I think there's definitely an opportunity there to to invest or share the cost of running user research and having that um, be contracted out by the Known Foundation. Uh, that worked successfully last time, and you know, if there are particular questions that you think are relevant to the Fedora community that you would like to be investigated in more detail and have the upstream design team work work on then that's that's definitely a door that is open and okay. um you know likewise with any kind of data that you want to send our way like um we always need more data it's amazing how little we know about our users and you know i mentioned i'm doing this uh, user survey so we'll be looking for help in getting the word out about that when it comes up and yeah we had we, we did a sort of a general fedora um contributor survey and that got about a thousand responses which is pretty good yeah so I, I think we might even get more for a user focused survey so we can we can we can help provide good information there yeah another example of, of something that benefits both upstream us and, and fedora is the cooperation with the mobile and pre-installing little on laptops like keeping that going and making it grow and successful Enterprise, I think yeah. it benefits all of us. We we have another laptop um, we're working with that's going to be pretty exciting. Um, that's cool. See how that goes. Uh, 
I, I can't say who it is or what's going on. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I'm, yeah. I can't, I can't tell you, Neil, sorry. Uh, but, um, yeah. Uh, and more, more stuff with Lenovo. Um, a lot of right now there's just COVID supply chain issues. They launched the, um, X1 Carbon Gen 9 with Fedora Workstation on it and then immediately said it would be available with four month delays. So, um, it's kind of out of out of their control uh, as everything in the world is right now, but you know, hopefully that will slowly get better as well. One one more question. We've kind of touched on this some, um, but you know, what do you see as you know the future of both? you know, GNOME specifically, but also the Linux desktop more broadly in, say, five to ten years? Just a small question to end on. Yeah, nice. It's a good one. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> oh, I'm pretty sure I'll still be using Linux on my desktop in five years. I have a prediction for like, the wider world. I, mean, I don't know. People like to, like, uh, make gloomy predictions or um, predict the demise of 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 this uh, entire I guess ecosystem, but I, I'm not that negative. I think people will keep using it because it's it's fun and it's easy to take away with, and um, we can maybe grow a little. We, we will not take over the world, I think, but that we don't have to. Yeah, I mean, I think on my side, you know, I think things are really positive upstream right now. You know, we've got um, a new generation of contributors who've come into the project and are doing amazing things. And there's things happening in the project right now that, you know, I, I wouldn't have dreamt of three or four years ago. Uh, you know, new apps being written, um, a lot of activity around the application developer platform, you know, a real sense of energy. You know, that's reflected on the design side in terms of I think, you know, we've got a much more comprehensive uh, design system than we ever used to. And you know, I think we're in a much stronger place than we have been for a long, long time. So in that respect, you know, I'm pretty optimistic and I, I think we're going to see a lot of good keep coming out of that. Um, in particular around apps, app development, it's going to get a lot easier to, it's going to continue to get easier to make apps and it's, the apps that we do produce, the quality is going to get better and better all the time. So I think that's really exciting and, and, and positive. Um, I think, I think you know, on the on up, upstream on the the foundation side, there's a lot of interest in taking the platform into new markets and um, you know going out into the world a bit more, like rather than you know, catering to the usual kind of uh, communities that we, we uh, are close to us and close to our hearts, but, you know, reaching out to new audiences and really promoting the product a bit more forcefully. So I, I think both of those things, I think combined could be could be powerful. Like, like Matthias said, I don't think we are gonna necessarily take over the world, but um, I don't see any reason why things aren't gonna be getting better and better. We're in a good path at the moment. You should um, aim for um, taking over the world, <laughs> <laughs> because that's how you—that's how you do the best that you can do. Yeah, perhaps it's a—it's—it's uh, it's, it's good to have high, lofty goals. Um, all right, well, uh, thank you very much for joining us for this. Um, and uh, next month we are—it uh, is Nest with Fedora. Our, own conference so we will be off for the month for video calls and we'll see what we're doing the month after that uh, i hope to see a lot of gnome folks at nest as well uh, and we'll see you at quadec in the meantime and we'll get this video up online for everybody else to see soon too thanks all thanks a lot thanks okay.